is Pamela Smythe from the University of Waterloo. I'm one of the hosts of Beyond the Bulletin, the podcast of internal communications at the university. We bring you news and views from the U Waterloo community. Please spread the word that we're on soundcloud.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And now the interview from episode 150 of Beyond the Bulletin. The Anti-Racism Unit on campus works to integrate anti-racism principles in all we do. Within the Office of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Anti-Racism, the team works with equity-deserving people who experience or witness racism and works to proactively address racism with a number of initiatives. Janisha Wilson is the Director of Anti-Racism at Waterloo. She's here to discuss the unit's priorities and plans and what we can all do to advance anti-racism efforts at the university. Janisha, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Let's start off with discussing the mandate of the anti-racism office. In simplest terms, the anti-racism unit is to embed anti-racism um, principles and practices across the University of Waterloo and to really ground that work in an intersectional framework, um, as well as a trauma-informed framework. So really understanding um, how those three frameworks work together to, to better the campus. It's about looking at our, our, our systems, the ways in which we do work at the university, looking at our policies, our procedures, and really analyzing the history of how those policies and procedures came to be, and what would an anti-racism lens lend to examining those practices and policies to better the university campus, as one example. Oh. Um, another you know, thing that our office does is that we try to guide and support folks that have experiences of racism on campus to find resolution, find support, find restorative justice from those experiences so they continue to feel like camp- campus community members and feel included in this space. Outside of those two very, I think, straightforward practices, we also try to work very closely with historically um, marginalized community members to ensure that new processes, practices, projects at the university really consider those folks. So an example of this is working very closely with Black and Indigenous populations and communities around, uh, surrounding the, the campus to help feel, um, help them feel more welcomed, help them feel more included in the university space, and um, can envision themselves as potential students, faculty, staff at our campus. If we took a look at our various policies, how would we approach that from an anti-racism perspective? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think oftentimes um, folks assume we, we create policies that are general ones that kind of overlay and cover everyone. And one of the most fundamental things is depending on the perspective you bring um, and your lived experiences, your worldview, that is kind of what is captured in, in a lot of policies and procedures. And so if we take a policy like 33, which is around um, ethical behavior, one of the things that we've been working very closely um, based on the part recommendations is to add clear definitions of what racism is, because that's not included in there, even though we know that is a part of unethical behavior. So depending on um, who is creating these policies and how often they're reviewed and updated, things get missed, things get um, left out, and it ends up um, impacting the folks that's, whose perspectives are not at the table when these policies are created. There's a good chance that things can be left out, and um, as a result, those policies that then cover off folks that are from these diverse backgrounds that come into the university really feel the the impact when they're not included. And so going back to that definition of racism, if someone can identify that this is the policy in which they would use if they're experiencing racism, then they might feel like there's nowhere to go to make a disclosure of harm. Now, how does anti-racism differ from equity, diversity, and inclusion? You know, for example, equity um, often looks at how do we create equitable playing fields for folks and where anti-racism is, is, is fun. It's a couple things, right? It's, it's about the actions that we take. The, the, we literally can embody, be, embody this work and be anti-racist, right? And be, it's, it's an action word. Um, it's fundamentally about system redesign and looking at historical processes and the ways in which policies have been created to create inequities and create op- oppressive practices and really going deep digging and changing and redesigning those systems so they they're corrected where equity often and or diversity and inclusion often look at how do we get 
more diversity in a space. It's more of a numbers game. Uh, uh, you know, how do we how do we get more representation in a space? Inclusion often um, means how do we include people in spaces that have been historically um, exclusive to them versus redesigning the space so that they have a say in what that space looks like. Right. Um, I can think of, you know, the work that uh, Jean Becker is doing with her team around indigenization and re-envisioning the university campus. That in itself could be seen as not only decolonizing work, but also anti-racist work. Right. Of how do we recreate this campus community so that it is it is inclusive of indigenous pedagogy, ways of thinking, ways of processing, but also living and breathing in this space in a very thoughtful way where oftentimes when we think about equity, not to say that it's less than or, or, or not equally important because it is, um, we often think of how do we get um, racialized people who are not currently um, at the same level of someone and get them up there. So we're looking at um, just finding equitable spaces for people to be a part of things versus redesigning spaces so that this is not a point of conversation. We're not trying to even the playing fields, if that makes sense. Hmm. How does your work relate to what's in the part report? Yeah, the part report is, wow, it's a, it's a big document, 88 recommendations that I think Vivek has done a really good job of, um, you know, putting some words to in terms of seeing this work as a, the role of everyone on campus and not just one unit. And so that really helps set the frame of how then our office would support um, folks doing the part recommendation. So I know through the work of Anita Taylor, who is our senior director, she is helping coordinate and strategically lead folks that are responsible for the different recommendations to implement them in their respective departments, offices, or faculties, right? And so our work, um, I liken it to thinking about someone who is um, not necessarily holding the pen on the work. We are supporting, guiding, providing subject matter expertise to folks that are responsible for executing the work. It's almost like having a, a team of folks to help coach you and guide you through the work in a meaningful and thoughtful way, but allowing individuals to have ownership over this work because it's within their department or within their purviews of their job, which I think is is a beautiful way to do the work and is also a very progressive and sustainable way to do this work. We're supporting people as they get through, go through the process of implementing their recommendations and providing subject matter expertise, guidance, support. What goes into making an institution like Waterloo anti-racist? It, it takes a lot of um, vulnerability to, to engage in anti-racism work. It takes a lot of um, self-reflection or introspection about who you are, how do you relate to folks most impacted by racism, and how do you move from that place of self-learning about what anti-racism is and actually then acting on those understandings. I think when it's something so personal and something that leads to a lot of discomfort for many individuals, um, not just racialized folks, it's about how do we do this in a thoughtful way without folks feeling so vulnerable to the point where they retract in the work. So a lot of that is um, starting very simple to having conversations around what it is, so building competency and capacity, moving beyond that to look at commitment, what is actually possible within your role, um, within your position, within your peer view uh, um, in the institution, and what can you do on a very small scale level that will lead to that larger collective impact. And I think that if we, as a university that has somewhat over like 46,000 people, actually took that process into mind, we could have some seriously impactful outcomes as an institution. But I think what often happens is folks are on a, on a sliding scale of feeling committed but overwhelmed, feeling committed but frozen and not, not, showing, not sure what to do, feeling as though they're not the right person to do this work and it should be led and be done by in, you know, folks most impacted by, by racism. And then we have individuals who just want to see it get done because they're hurting from the experiences of racism on campus. And so you have a sliding scale of different needs and priorities. And we really need to figure out as an organization or as a university how to coordinate that and validate everyone's experience, but still get the work done. So it's, and, and the best way I can say this is not something that's gonna happen in a year or two. This is gonna require some significant multi-leveled, multi-intersectional um, efforts to get to that place of just being able to see some basic basic outcomes, like everyone having a standard, a particular standard of understanding of what racism, anti-racism is and what racism is, even just basic competency, that could take a couple of years, right? Um, let alone some of the larger efforts and work that we'll be able to see come out of this. But I think that um, with all that being said, I don't want to 
diminish people's efforts thus far. I don't want to take away from the hard work that everyone has done. And I don't want to discourage anyone because it's similar to um, truth and reconciliation. It is a lifelong commitment. It is something you do within your workplace or within your place of study, but it's also something you would do in the real world and in your life. Hmm. And those things are not separate. So as long as there is um, harm that happens external to the university, it will also happen internal to the university. It's also trying to find that larger, broader community um, response to the issue of racism on campus and in, in our society. It does seem oftentimes in anti-racism work that it's, a, it's often the people who are most impacted personally who are doing a lot of the heavy lifting is that a fair assessment? I think, yes, that is a fair assessment. And I think that comes back to the sheer fact that if, including myself as someone who is racialized, I'm Afro-Indo-Jamaican, right? So I, I sit in a, in a very interesting space of doing this work, but also being directly impacted by racism. And I do this work not only because I'm really passionate about it, but it could be the matter of my safety or my community safety or you know, my ability to live a resilient and, you know, happy life. And so oftentimes we see this strong tie of folks who are most impacted by racism doing the work because it is so deeply tied to our well-being and our livelihood. How do you get people engaged? Oh, it depends. You have people that are just hungry for knowledge, which I'm always thankful for those individuals who just want to be a part of this work and want to know how to do this work. And then there are individuals who are generally just not interested and don't see the importance of this. We'll always have those individuals. It's a matter of working with the folks who are close in close proximity to wanting to do it, make a difference and really supporting them in terms of getting to that place. Waterloo is fairly young when you compare us to other institutions in Canada of our size anyway. Do you think the fact that we're a young institution is a helpful thing or does it hinder efforts? It's like, I feel like it could be both ways, right? Depending on the way you look at this, um, being a young institution um, and having institutions that are older than you, you can learn from their mistakes, right? And there's so much, there's so much room for opportunity and innovation, which, you know, this is what, you know, uh, Waterloo prides itself on. But also when you are like any new organization, when you're, you're, you're growing and learning, there's always opportunities to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes, right? Internally, irrespective of what um, institutions are out there to look to. So the, the way I see it is because anti-racism is, is, is around deep seated system, system change work. We have an opportunity because of the youngness of Waterloo to really have momentum to pivot and change. We also have to be thoughtful about what would be meaningful, what would be helpful for the individuals that are most impacted by racism to ensure that the changes that we're making really reflect the changes that are needed in the institution. So that's why that part report, for example, and the work that part did, which was massive in terms of consultation with staff, student, faculty, um, really being thoughtful in their consultation process helps us to make a commitment that is based on evidence that is based on thoughtfulness so that when we do go forth and implement part we're not making mistakes in that process we are basing it off of what we've heard from the campus community and what is needed in the campus community Hmm. it all depends on who is currently at the institution and what their commitment is to anti-racism work because i think that you often see in organizations that are doing change management, the right leadership, the right um, staff, the right faculty, the right group of individuals can have profound impact um, on the direction of an organization and what the outcomes are. And how is it going? I'll be honest, since I've started, I've had a really positive reception from folks that are very interested in the work that I do. Good. I, I feel very proud when I come to work every morning. I feel very motivated to be here. I do this work for all the lovely people that I've been able to meet on campus, staff, student, faculty that are racialized, that are deeply impacted by racism in their everyday interactions that tell me um, how happy they are to see me on campus and to work with me and that I'm here as a resource. So that gives me a lot of purpose. So what can we, individual members of the campus community, do to advance anti-racism efforts? I think the most important thing that we can do right now is look at your position and if you're in a position of power, what you have access to and what you're able to do and think about how can you shift power and resources to better support 
folks most impacted by racism. That could be simply, um, you know, if you are an AVP, that could be looking at your hiring practices and making sure that you're, you're hiring individuals that come with anti-racism competencies so that that helps build your team in a very thoughtful way. If you are a a faculty member, it could mean checking in with, you know, the the the, the racial minority or the, the racialized students in your in your class to make sure that they are feeling confident, they're feeling good about being on campus. Um, it ranges from what we can do. It's about taking a very human-centered approach to checking in with folks, making sure they're okay, but also shifting resources and being thoughtful in our in terms of our positional power and how we can disrupt and address racism. And then the, the number one thing I think everyone should do on a regular basis, irrespective if you're racialized or not, is to have a lot of introspection, a lot of self-reflection on how is what I'm doing impacting others and what can I do to correct that action if it is impacting folks in a very negative way. Right. I often think that the biggest action one can do is to be vulnerable and reach out and say, I don't know what to do and I would really like some help. Um, I think often folks assume that we only engage with anti-racism as an afterthought or when it's, you know, a response. And I, and I encourage the campus communities to please reach out. Let's put our minds together and think about how we can do this, of how can we be innovative and, and do this work and, and so that we, ha- we, can, we can be inspirational to one another and not... Um, when, when there's a crisis. So I, I encourage folks to reach out and please engage because I'm happy to work with everyone on campus and I see the collective impact that we can have. And as someone who has experiences of racism and, and, and has been impacted by racism, I'm, I'm looking to my, my campus, uh, my fellow campus um, staff, faculty and students to, to do this work um, in solidarity with me. What initiatives have you got coming up that are exciting you? Right now, we are working on a project that is called a, it's a Sankofa Pathways to University, and we're looking to work with Black and Indigenous youth who have been historically underserved, but also um, we have a low enrollment at Waterloo of these two particular groups of students, and hopefully create an environment where they feel they can, they can engage in this campus experience through taking a course. We are designing the program so that it is deeply rooted in uh, Black and Indigenous pedagogy. So there'll be two phases. The first phase will be Black student focused. The second phase will be Indigenous student focused. Um, And it will be content that reflects their lived experiences. So the age group that we're targeting is ideally grade 11 students, students that are coming towards the end of their high school experience and are in university bound classes that do not foresee themselves applying to a post-secondary institution. And I know a lot of folks will probably say, does that really happen? And um, I'm happy to disclose that I'm one of those students that many, many, many years ago, over two decades ago, who was, um, I had really great academics, um, but throughout my entire um, education um, in elementary and uh, secondary school, Um, was often told or discouraged that I would not be able to go to university or not be able to make it in post-secondary education. And that impacts one's psychological well-being, one's confidence in many ways. And then other projects that we have going is we're creating a five-part module in partnership with the uh, David Davidi's office, the AVPA office, um, around anti-racism, anti-oppression. And so that module will be on Learn, hopefully in May, June, um, and accessible to the entire campus community to help build competency and capacity across our, our institution. And it will be accessible for staff, students, and faculty. So that's also very exciting. And that we're hoping to also engage um, with, with the lead of the Secretariat, obviously, some policy review. There's tons of other initiatives we're working on, but I think I'll speak to those now and uh, we'll provide more updates in the near future about the rest of them. Thank you very much for this information and for speaking with me today. I'm, I'm really happy I'm able to chat with you about this and share this information. And I hope that others can also can hear the joy in this work because it has so much benefits for a university. So I'm very proud of it. So thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this interview from the Beyond the Bulletin podcast from the University of Waterloo. You will find our archive of full episodes on the University of Waterloo website. Select interviews are on the university's YouTube channel. Just look for our playlist there. 
Please join Brandon Sweet and me for new episodes, and don't forget to tell your Waterloo connections about us.